Uh, all right, thank you so much to the organizers for, um, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Brian Lang. Uh, I'm a partner and a data scientist at Datascope. Uh, Datascope is a data science consultancy based here in Chicago. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that actually means uh, and what we actually do uh, in just a few slides. First thing to know about us that's kind of relevant to this is that Python is kind of our lingua franca at Datascope. So if you don't know this term, uh, it's like in language, it's the standard language used by everybody in a society, regardless of sort of what their mother tongue was or what they grew up learning. So Python's kind of the common denominator for us, and it's what we use on a lot of the work that we do. Um, when we need to use other things, we use other things. But um, if we need to make something that will definitely be usable by everybody at Datascope, Python's kind of our go-to. Um, reasons for that, and I know that Jupyter is not just Python these days, but uh, I thought this would maybe offer a little context. And that's kind of how I came to start using Jupyter in my work. Um, so why use Python for things? Probably a lot of the reasons that you guys use Python for things. Uh, great community, great libraries to build on top of, especially for data science types of applications. Uh, readability and maintainability, we just kind of have a crush on the language in general and how it looks and how it works. Um, great for prototyping. So one thing to know about Datascope is that we work really iteratively. Um, we want to get things in front of a client as quickly as we can and use their feedback to figure out what the next thing we should be doing is rather than assume up front that we know what's best and kind of have a long running expensive project that nobody ends up happy with at the end. So Python's great for that because of all these libraries and because of the community and things like that. It's really easy to get something simple up quickly and get feedback and iterate on it. Uh, another great thing, so I think we're going to hear from some people later today who are using Python in the world of science. Turns out scientists tend to make great data scientists. Um, and so if we can hire people from the world of science who already know a robust pro programming language, a lot of times it's Python. So um, that's another reason that we like using it. And uh, for the people who don't, it's easy to learn, it's easy to teach. Uh, so not everybody that we hire as a data science firm is going to have a, a long software engineering background. Um, they're not necessarily going to know these things off the bat. We're okay with that. Um, they, they may have learned or uh, done their work in MATLAB or R or Stata or SAS or something. Um, and, and that's fine because they probably did that because the people they were working for mandated it or their professor mandated it. And um, by the time they get to Datascope, as long as they're good learners, uh, which is kind of what we look for, then they can pick Python up. We're confident about that because we've all done it. <laughs> uh, Cool, so what does Datascope actually do? What does a data science firm do? Um, so we kind of, I think a lot of the work that we do kind of falls into four buckets. Um, and I'm gonna talk a set, uh, mostly about a couple of these, but I'll, I'll give you the overview. Um, so strategy, so Safi was talking about strategy in the context of uh, Kiwi and McCallum earlier. Uh, we kind of do some of this stuff too, help companies figure out what they could be doing with data, what they should be doing with data. Um, where the opportunities are, what's something really unique that you could do that none of your competitors are doing with data. Um, just try to ask the right questions. That's where we think like the best work starts from. Uh, then we do consulting. So this is really, I think you could boil this down to just answering questions, right? Using data to answer questions. Um, that could be questions about their business, questions about their market, questions about their product, um, using data to answer those things. We do development work, so we actually um, help build sort of more robust tools that are become parts of a system. Um, things like APIs that provide a 12-week data science boot camp. So um, for people who aren't inside a company and are just trying to get into data science, we're helping them do that. So what do we actually use Jupyter for? We haven't really found a way to wedge Jupyter into our strategy stuff yet. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe we will by the end of the day. But um, Primarily consulting and training. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about mo in most detail today. Um, so an example of what the what does a consulting um, engagement look like for Datascope. I'm going to give this example project, which is probably our most typical consulting engagement. Um, and it's actually the one where we kind of first started using Jupyter um, most extensively internally. So we did a little work for this tiny company out in the Bay called Oracle. Um, if, if the only way that you know Oracle is uh, they're that company that bugs you to update Java every once in a while, uh, 
they also have a, a they do a lot of hardware stuff too, and that's actually one of the part of the company we're working for is a hardware part, uh, right? So they supply servers and they supply storage and all the stuff that goes into data centers. Oracle makes a lot of it, um, and you can imagine if you're a company that makes hardware and software and you support it, uh, you spend a lot of time debugging things. So um, so there's a ton of people inside of Oracle who their job is, hey, this server totally failed. Um, it's not working at all. I can't figure out what's going on. Can you please repair this damn thing because our website is slower right now or whatever the, you know, whatever the consequences are. Uh, so they have rooms full of engineers who are trying to figure this stuff out based on the logs and uh, the things that kind of a, a server spits out right before its last breath. Um, and uh, what the sort of question we arrived at through some of that more like strategic level of thinking was, could we automate this, right? Could we take all that stuff that the server's spitting out? That's data. Logs are data. Um, it, you know, uh, response time, stats, those are data. It's all stuff that we could maybe use to help find those problems more quickly and maybe even just send them parts automatically, right? So if we know this is what it looks like, this is the profile of when a hard drive in a RAID array crashes or you know, shatters into a million pieces or whatever it does, um, then could we just go ahead and ship that? Whoop. Uh, so we, that's, what, that's the question we were trying to answer. That was kind of the goal of this engagement. Um, so Oracle being a uh, giant company full of software engineers didn't really want to hire us to do software development, which makes sense. Um, but they did want to hire us to, to sort of teach them about and do research on the data science component of it. Um, so that's what we did. We consulted with software engineers within Oracle to sort of help them realize how they could do something like this. Uh, and we found out within sort of a matter of weeks that you could maybe automate parts of this. Um, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of caveats in there, but uh, but you could. We, we were getting results from from classifiers that were basically saying like, yeah, these are these are not bad. Um, and if you consider, you have to take into account the costs of how much does it cost to ship a hard drive versus lose a customer, <laughs> um, and that's kind of the calculus that they they were doing on the back end while we're exploring these things, but. Um, the bottom line is we, we use Jupyter a lot on this project, collaborating with these software engineers. Um, and, and we discovered a lot of the things that we really like using Jupyter for, especially in these sort of consulting type of engagements. Um, and those things include sort of exploring data sets interactively, right? So you, you got uh, some kind of dump somehow of something of some format, and you want to see what's inside, um, and you want to see how complete it is and how dirty it is. and um, what the values look like and be able to ask intelligent questions up front to figure out, okay, what do we have to work with? Uh, Jupyter's great for that. Interactive environments are great for that and Jupyter's probably one of the best. Um, so we like using Jupyter for that. Uh, we like using Jupyter for building plots. Um, maybe your mind is, works differently than mine and if so, we should talk, but for me, using matplotlib or matplotlib requires a lot of trial and error, <laughs> a lot of uh, okay, let me, let me throw another line in here, and it's, it's a very sort of, you, you have to iterate to get the thing to look how you want it to, right? And so this is another place where using an interactive environment is going to help out a lot with that, especially when you can see the plots in line like you can in Jupyter. Um, and then annotated examples of how to do things in Python. So we're uh, working with these software engineers, and we wanted to sort of show them like, achieved what we were trying to achieve with, you know, uh, scikit-learn or whatever other tools we were using on that project, um, show them code and include sort of markdown blocks that are explaining what's going on for these people who don't have a machine learning background. Um, Jupyter Notebooks are great for that. We also, in this project, though, started to run up against sort of like, uh, what could we not use Jupyter for? Uh, and that's going to be part of my talk today. I hope I don't come across as overly pessimistic about things. Um, but I think some of the things we started to realize in this project where we were using it for almost everything was that the code we were writing was different in a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, there's sort of a greater friction to make things modular, to um, make functions and classes and all the more sort of structured programming things. Um, and we kind of started to fall into that, oh, I'm never going to run this again mentality. 
um, that that thing that is, if you've done a project like this, you know is probably not true by the end of the day, right? You think, well, I'm just going to work through this, and I'm going to get to this nice plot at the bottom, and I'm going to send them the plot in the email, and I'm going to be done, and I don't really need to care about having nice, you know, verbose variable names or things like that. Uh, and that, that's not what happens. You know, the, the stuff at the top, you're going to use that again 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 times. Um, and if you put that in a Python function in something that you could import, then you would save yourself a lot of time. Uh, this actually got to the point where one of my coworkers um, gave a controversial lunchtime talk called IPython Notebooks Considered Harmful. <laughs> Making the point, like, hey, should we even be using this? Like, it's resulting in, you know, in some senses it's very useful, but in other senses it's making us actually produce worse work. Like, it's not as good. It's not as reusable. Um, and I think the reasons for this are that because of the, some of the strengths of Jupyter, things like the fact you can execute things out of order, the, um, that kind of is what leads to this method of, of using them. Um, and can get you to an answer really quickly, but also can kind of bite you in the ass later. Um, but I think we sort of arrived at a, at a more uh, enlightened, yes, we should always use these for everything, or not, you know, no, we should never use these for anything, level which is that the art of using these things, especially in a consulting uh, environment, is that you need to know when and how to convert them into something that's more reusable. Um, I actually think the, the metaphor of a notebook is like really apt for the way that you use these things. Um, they're really great for getting your thoughts out quickly and sharing your thoughts with others. Um, and you put them on a shelf somewhere, and you might refer back to them later a few times. Um, but at some point, if you're trying to write a novel, you need to be aware of when to take your, your work out of the notebook and put it into a word processor so you can move things around and label them and make a table of contents and that, that type of thing to stretch this metaphor a little too far. Um, <laughs> So, so this is something to, to keep in mind, I guess. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is our training work. Um, so to sort of give the background on this, we started thinking about data science training in 2014. This company called Metis came to us. They are actually a part of Kaplan, the test prep company. Um, Kaplan was trying to sort of do uh, skills training for the new economy. That's the buzzword for it. But you know, it's, it's programming and data science and things like that, because that's where this is going, right? They want people to be able to, to learn those things, because maybe they don't care about uh, nailing their ACT anymore. Maybe they just want to learn how to, how to be an elite hacker and move to the Bay, or whatever. Um, so, but in a very, sa what I think was a very savvy move, in 2014, they came to us and they said, hey, we're going to make a 12-week data science boot camp. We don't know what a data scientist needs to know. Like, we don't, <laughs> we, don't, we don't know, what does a data scientist do at work? Even some data scientists don't know that. I, I, don't, I don't really know that. That changes, like, week to week. But what should we teach these people who want to become data scientists? So we designed a curriculum for them, um, and members of Datascope taught the first three of these things in New York. Um, and now they're, it's still running strong in New York and San Francisco, and maybe expanding to other cities later this year, but you didn't hear that from me. Um, and... Uh, and yeah, so that's kind of how we got started on this whole training thing. Um, then last year, we started to actually do some corporate courses through them. So helping these people inside companies who are um, da maybe data analysts right now, essentially. People who are spending a lot of time in Excel and SAS, and if they just knew how to program, they just knew how to use a Jupyter notebook, like they could do things beyond their wildest dreams, but they, it's, it's just like, just that far away. So that's what we were trying to help them with. And similarly, uh, things in machine learning, like there are, there are new ways of doing things that they didn't learn while they were in school, right? Because only the people who were studying CS learned that in school. Um, and only if they were interested in machine learning at the time and, and could wade through what the hell like a perceptron was or whatever. Um, so, so we started doing these two week intensives um, focusing on data modeling in Python. Uh, so I taught three of these last year with some of my coworkers, um, and we used Jupyter a lot in them. But uh, first, I'm going to talk about that day that we misused Jupyter. <laughs> uh, this was the second day of the class, and the first day had not gone off without a hitch. Um, we had a lot of sort of figuring out, getting things installed on people's machines, getting around corporate firewalls and things we didn't uh, anticipate. Uh, so we were behind. We had a lot of material to cover. Um, 
And so the way we were planning on doing that was we had all these notebooks of this material we wanted to cover. So we put them up on a projector, and we stepped through them cell by cell, and we filled things in, and we had the people who were uh, in the class sort of trying to follow along in a dark room doing this for uh, four to five hours of that day. Um, and then we sat down for dinner at the end of the day and kind of looked at each other. This was my coworker, Ermac, and we were like, man, today sucked. <laughs> and, and we didn't exactly, couldn't put our finger on why at that time. We were just like, oh, I don't know why, but today definitely sucked. Like, people, people didn't seem motivated. People uh, seemed tired at the end of the day, didn't seem excited about coming back tomorrow. And this is day two of a two-week course. Um, we were exhausted. We, we were like, wow, why am I so tired? I don't, all I did was hit, you know, next cell on a computer all day. I don't get it. Um, and to understand, I think the way we diagnose this later on um, is, uh, is, you know, the way we diagnose everything as data scientists with data. Um, so this is actually, we ran an assessment before this class. We, we did a uh, sort of a 25 question little Python quiz to see where people were coming in because we wanted to know in theory, they had learned some Python in the past, but maybe not all that much. Um, so you can, it's kind of hard to see the labels on here, but the bottom of that bell curve is 50% correct, and the top is 100. So this is, you hear about this when you hear about people talk about teaching, about teaching to a bell curve. It really is a bell curve. Um, and in this case, there's a pretty damn wide one. So there were people who um, didn't really know what was going on, and there were other people who were superstars. The people who didn't really know what was going on that day that we went through a bunch of notebooks on screen, they were totally lost, right? They fell behind, they mistyped something, they didn't understand conceptually why we were doing what we were doing, and so they just kind of gave up and sat, sat there and were along for the ride, didn't feel like they got much out of it. Meanwhile, the people at the top of the bell curve were bored as hell, <laughs> right? They were like, I've done all this before, come on, what, give me something new, teach me something I don't already know. Um, and so this is, this is why I think like, Code alongs can be an interesting way to convey information, but what we found was a much better way, especially in a class when you have this much variation in skill level, was self-guided challenges. And this is like personally one of my favorite uses of Jupyter that we've come across as a company. Um, so if you imagine kind of those like worksheets you got in middle school, uh, Jupyter notebooks can kind of emulate that in some ways. You can use the markdown cells to write challenges and give some theoretical background and even show images about uh, various machine learning concepts and then ask a question. And then the answer to that question goes in an interactive Python cell that sits right underneath. Um, and in that cell, the students can really show their work. They can experiment. Um, and we can open this notebook and basically see, you know, how far did they get? How did they approach solving this problem? And uh, to sort of hit every level of that bell curve, you just throw at them more self-guided challenges than any human could possibly achieve. Um, and the people who are really smart are gonna try, <laughs> and they're gonna get a lot out of it. And the people who are struggling are gonna you know, make it to that minimum level, and we'll give them help when we can. Um, and this ended up being sort of how we st structured the rest of the class, and uh, it's actually really easy to take something that you planned to do kind of like as a lecture and turn it into an exercise like this. So this was kind of how we ended up using these in the way that we teach. Um, and it's, it's been super effective. So if you're trying to sort of teach various things in Python or data science or, um, or all the other things that you can do in Jupyter now, R and Julia, things like that, um, I highly recommend trying to structure your class to have sort of more of this self-guided elasticity in it. Um, so uh, now's the part of the talk where uh, I'm gonna get a little more philosophical and try to abstract up from uh, what I was just talking about. And you could call this the takeaways section, I guess. So remember that bell curve, right? Um, I think the biggest lesson, the sort of like, if you could boil that down to one phrase um, that we took away from that is to keep your audience in mind. Right, so if we, had, if we had been thinking or if we had paid attention to um, who we were actually teaching to, we would have known that the way that we were going through that content was not gonna be compelling to them. I've seen lots of people do crazy things with Jupyter Notebooks and JavaScript libraries for their uh, presentations, and I think engineers have a tendency to try and engineer away the anxiety of presenting or teaching. 
Um, I know because I am one. Do you see that animated GIF I just put on the screen? Yeah, yeah, right. I did that because I'm nervous because I'm talking in front of you, right? But having some really slick programming tool that you use to try and convey information doesn't make up for the fact that if you don't know who you're talking to um, and the level at which they're going to understand things and find them interesting, you can't fix that no matter how, no matter what tool you use. Um, and then the other thing, so I'm going to take a slight tangent here. This is a great book. Um, this is a book I had to read in engineering school, uh, The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. There's an idea in this book called affordances, um, and this is in sort of industrial design. When you see one of these things on a door, you push, right? Yeah, there's no sign on this door that says push. Um, this handle has what's called an affordance. It's form and the way that it moves and the way that it looks. You don't have to think about it. You just walk up to it and you're like, oh, push it. You don't go like, oh, let me just, you know, it's, it's, you don't even have to think about it, right? And it's just because of the way that it's shaped. It's obvious. Like, you're not going to pull on this thing. Meanwhile, here's, uh, the, you know, something that is also a push, right? And it has, and it, it's affordance, though. You walk up to this door, and uh, you're probably going to want to pull on it because of the way that it's shaped. Um, and you might think, no, maybe some, like, really do that. Um, not me. I'm smart. I, I, I use Jupiter, and I do science. And uh, I would read the door, and I would obviously pull on it. Or I would obviously push on it. See, I flipped it already. <laughs> I know this is not the case because uh, Datascope just moved offices. I work with a lot of really smart people. And our new doors look like this. And guess how many PhDs I've seen try to, try to uh, pull on a door that you're supposed to push on. So why am I talking about door handles, right? We, we just flew like way, way off of Jupiter land. Because the tools you use have affordances, right? So the tools you use to get your work done, they make certain things hard, make certain things easy. Um, and you might not even necessarily be cognizant of that while you're using them. Um, so that's what I want you to do. I want you to be aware of the affordances that your tools have. Um, and do your best to choose the right tool for the job. And train yourself to know when you should reconsider what tool you're using. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks are phenomenal for a lot of things. Um, they're not a bludgeon for all, all possible work that you should use them on. Um, and that's true for any tool. There's no panacea for this thing. So think about the, tool, the affordances of the tools you have. Hack on the tools you have to change those affordances to your advantage when you can. Um, and yeah. You know, just be mindful about those things. Uh, so I know I'm a little over time. Thanks for your time. Um, last plug, Datascope's always accepting applications to work with us. Uh, so if any of this stuff sounds interesting to you, you can find it on our website by the cute animal pictures. Thanks.